Part 6 of 13 from set number 2005, Introducing C.G. Jung's Red Book, a BC Recordings copyrighted presentation by Stefan Heller entitled Jung's Red Book, Book 2, Chapters 12 through 17. Now then, we shall proceed with our uh, text and we will come now to chapter 12 entitled Hell. And we have had some encounters with hellish things before in the earlier chapters, but this is somewhat different. So let me read to you uh, some initial paragraphs of the chapter. On the second night after the creation of my God, which is the material that we dealt with last time, a vision made known to me that I had reached the underworld. I find myself in a gloomy vault whose floor consists of damp stone slabs. In the middle there is a column from which ropes and axes hang. At the foot of the column there lies an awful serpent-like tangle of human bodies. At first I catch sight of the figure of a young maiden with wonderful red-gold hair. A man of devilish appearance is lying half under her, His head is bent backward, a thin streak of blood runs down his forehead, two similar diamonds, that is the AI, like demon, only it is not, let's put it that way, because a a demon in modern parlance is is a devil, but a diamond, a daimonion, really means a, a spirit. Their faces bear an inhuman expression, the living evil, their muscles are taut and hard, and their bodies sleek like serpents. They lie motionless. The maiden holds her hand over one eye of the man lying beneath her, who is the most powerful of the three. Her hand firmly clasps a small silver fishing rod that she has driven into the eye of the devil. I break out in a profuse cold sweat. They wanted to torture the maiden to death, but she defended herself with the force of the most extreme despair and succeeded in piercing the eye of the evil one with the little hook. If he moves, she will tear out his eye with a final jerk. The horror paralyzes me. What will happen? A voice speaks. The evil one cannot make a sacrifice. He cannot sacrifice his eye. Victory is with the one who can sacrifice, which of course would indicate that victory is not with the evil one. So then comes, after these initial passages, comes a reflection by Jung on the nature and the role of good and evil. As those of you who were here last time will recall in uh, some of the chapters that we reviewed last time, we certainly saw a tremendous manifestation of good in the way in which Jung revives and brings to life again the deity that then ascends into the heavens. But now we are seeing sort of the opposite polarity, not the uh, resurrectional elements that were connected with the god Isdubar, the creation of his god, as Jung calls it, which was the earlier event, propels him now into the underworld. He forcefully extols the proposition that when accomplishing a great and good deed, one also comes in touch with the dark power of evil. The maiden in the vision is his soul, struggling with the evil one. When fullness and goodness appear, then evil appears also. Of course, you have to keep in mind that this pertains to the manifest world with its dualities. And later on, we will see how he envisions, however, a a realm and a consciousness and a being that is beyond the opposites. But the issues of these opposites pertain to the manifest world, including the manifest world of the psyche. The descent into hell undertaken by him here is part of the sacrifice that one has to make in connection with the great work. And the significant statement here, I think, is victory is with the one who can sacrifice. 
Perhaps this is why, this is purely my commentary, this is why Jesus Christ in Greek is often referred to as the Nika, the victor. For he sacrificed his life, and by way of that sacrifice he obtains victory over everything. In order for the newly born or the reborn God, in this case Isdubar, to be truly effective, the evil one must be confronted also. And this is how Jung expresses this. My God, this is Isdubar, the resurrected one, rose in the eastern sky, brighter than the heavenly host, and brought about a new day for all the peoples. This is why I want to go to hell. Would a mother not want to give up her life for her child? How much easier would it be to give up my life if only my God could overcome the torment of the last hour of the night and victoriously break through the red mist of the morning? I do not doubt. I also want evil for the sake of my God. I enter the unequal battle since it is always unequal and without doubt a lost cause. How terrible and despairing would this battle be otherwise? But precisely this is how it should and will be. Nothing is more valuable to the evil one than his eye, since only through his eye can emptiness cease gleaming fullness. Because the emptiness lacks fullness, It craves fullness and its shining power, and it drinks it in by means of its eye, which is able to grasp the beauty and unsullied radiance of fullness. The emptiness is poor, and if it lacked its eye, it would be hopeless. It sees the most beautiful and wants to devour it in order to spoil it. The devil knows what is beautiful, and hence he is the shadow of beauty and follows it everywhere, awaiting the moment when the beautiful, riding great with child, seeks to give life to the God. If your beauty grows, the dreadful worm will also creep up you, waiting for its prey. Nothing is sacred to him except his eye with which he sees the most beautiful. He will never give up his eye. He is invulnerable, but nothing protects his eye. It is delicate and clear, adept at drinking in the eternal light. It wants you the bright red light of your life. Pretty ominous, isn't it? Now, there are several principles asserted here. First, that one has to acknowledge and confront evil in order to do real good. Secondly, that evil being emptiness, in Greek called kenoma, wants to devour the fullness, known as pleroma, or as much of the fullness as possible. Some of you may recall considerable portions of the famous Gnostic Codex Pistis Sophia, where the archons are intent upon stealing Sophia's light. They are always after her in order to extract from her her light, because that is what they crave. There are similar notions in the Lurianic Kabbalah referring to the Clifford, who also crave light. And that the Darkness, the dark one here, does it by way of its eye. The portion of the eternal light that dwells in us is the object of attraction to what he calls the dreadful worm, the evil one. The good part of the human is further called by Jung in another passage, the harmless companion of his shadow. So already in this chapter, and we'll see it developing much more powerfully subsequently, now the realization that subsequently came to be enshrined in the psychological teaching of the shadow is noticed. These are really the roots of Jung's noted also opposition to the denial of evil. 
In all of his later psychological writings, Jung insisted very, very powerfully that any denial of evil leads to very dire results. Now, obviously, that does not mean that one has to uh, have more dealings with evil than necessary, or that one should give in to evil, or that one should in any way encourage and act out one's tendencies that might be called evil, but it means that one has to pay attention to this form of life, form of reality, and that when one doesn't, then one is asking for trouble. And Jung criticized on this basis some of the theological teaching in the Catholic Church of the Privatio Boni, which simply that came from Aquinas, I think mainly, that mainly means that evil consists in the absence of good. Where there is no good, that's evil. Jung said that's not enough. <laughs> because there is a, uh, let's say, a real, an active, one might almost say a positive aspect of evil. This is the positive aspect of negativity, you see, or of the negative. And that must be recognized. It's not just an absence of something. And, of course, on the other hand, the sort of all sweetness and light philosophies which always appear in our culture in some fashion or the other, probably their latest embodiments being within what some people pronounce the new age. The new age, okay. Uh, Such then is Jung's concern uh, for the upwelling of evil in the wake of his having given birth to his God. This is the when he brought Isdubar back to life. The Gnostic notion that in this world good and evil are always present and struggle with each other. As we find expressed, I believe, in the Gospel of Philip, if I'm not mistaken, that the good of this world is not good and its evil is not evil, but both shall be resolved into their beginning. So that the, these polarities which we encounter in life don't really have any ultimate reality, but they have an existential reality of considerable power and magnitude at the present time while we are here struggling in this world. So you already can see in this particular chapter in the 12th chapter of book 2 that he is now beginning to struggle with the issue of the role first of all the existence and the importance and the role of the darkness and of evil. The next chapter chapter 13 of book 2 is entitled The Sacrificial Murder pretty dark titles but it becomes even stranger as we go on so uh, have patience, it's going to get weirder as we, as we proceed. <laughs> At the beginning of the chapter Sacrificial Murder, we find the following. But this was the vision that I did not want to see, the horror that I did not want to live. A sickening feeling of nausea sneaks up on me, and abominable perfidious serpents wind their way slowly and cracklingly through the parched undergrowth. They hang down lazily and disgustingly lethargic from the branches, looped in dreadful knots. I am reluctant to enter this dreary and unsightly valley where the bushes stand in arid stony defiles. The valley looks so normal, its air smells of of crime, of foul, cowardly deeds. I am seized by disgust and horror. I walk hesitantly over the boulders, avoiding every dark place for fear of treading on a serpent. The sun shines weakly out of a grey and distant sky, and all the leaves are shriveled. A marionette with a broken head lies before me amidst the stones. A few steps further, a small apron, and then behind the bush the body of a small girl covered with terrible wounds, smeared with blood. One foot is clad with a stocking and shoe, the other is naked and gorily crushed. The head, where is the head? 
The head is a mash of blood with hair and whitish pieces of bone, surrounded by stone smeared with brain and blood. My gaze is captivated by this awful sight. A shrouded figure like that of a woman is standing calmly next to the child. Her face is covered by an impenetrable veil. Now, a lengthy dialogue ensues between the veiled feminine form and Jung. The veiled person asks Jung to perform a horrendous deed, which is detaching and eating from the liver of the corpse, the corpse of the child that lies before him. Jung rages and protests vociferously and only yields to the command when the veiled person introduces herself and says that she is the soul of the child. The editor notes a statement of Jung in Memories, Dreams and Reflections that according to an older view, the liver is the seat of life. Now, Jung performs the distasteful deed after the feminine figure told him to do so and when she introduced herself as to who she was. He does this with great reluctance and disgust. Now, you note here that we are, you know, we, we are introduced to the necessity of confronting certain uh, circumstances, certain energies, certain data in the psyche at the right time that are uh, pretty horrendous and that uh, have a way of really shaking us up. There are dark forms of mysterium tremendum but to confront them and to deal with them and no doubt in due form to turn them to higher purposes is an extremely important part of our development. Jung often pointed out in his scientific writings that even as a, a tree cannot grow only unidirectionally, it cannot only grow upwards, it also has to grow downwards. If the roots don't continue to grow, then the tree will become too heavy and fall out of the the ground, which actually does happen, especially when our usually very dry California soil receives big grains. I have seen magnificent, beautiful old deodar trees in, in the Ojai Valley and elsewhere just fall out of the ground. Well, that's because the roots were unable to hold the tree, and so we We have to grow downward into the darkness with our consciousness also if we are to grow up into the light and into the the air. So Jung goes ahead with this unpleasant task and upon this the veiled figure throws her veil back and she is a beautiful maiden with ginger hair and she asks, do you recognize me? Jung answers, how strangely familiar you are. Who are you? And the answer comes, I am your soul. So first it said, I am the soul of the child. Now it says, I am your soul, which means, of course, what? That the child is himself. It's an aspect of himself that he is sacrificing and then taking the, uh, the essence of that into himself once more. So the uh, conclusion is that something in us needs, this is the conclusion we may draw, I think, that something in us needs to suffer a sacrificial death. As we restore or regenerate the God in us, well, again, as we have noted in Jung's psychological writings, then appears as the self with the capital S, the image, the imago dei, the central archetype. So as this God is regenerated within us, we also must perform a sacrifice within us. It would seem that we are dealing here with the the making holy of the human personality itself, which is actually one of the more obscure meanings of the word sacrifice. Sacer in Latin means holy. Facere means to do, is to make something holy. So when we sacrifice something, we take it out of its mundane context and we introduce it into the holy.
in what Rudolf Otto would have called the holy. So if the born or reborn God is, at least in part, that self that we mentioned, the oversoul, the divine being in us, by way of the sacrifice in the personality, the lesser self becomes infused with the vivifying power that brings a deific working into the psyche. So as um, these sacrifices occur, the lesser self receives a kind of life that it allows it then to relate itself more responsively and more creatively to the greater self. It's sort of like a medicine. And certainly in archaic shamanic practices and so forth, various organs of animals and hopefully not of humans, are frequently used as a medicine in order to infuse some kind of energy into the sick person who takes the medicine. When it bore and gave birth to the God, this, is, this all refers back to Isdubar, my soul was of human nature throughout. It possessed the primordial powers since time immemorial, but only in a dormant condition. They flowed into forming the God without my help. But through the sacrificial murder, I redeemed the primordial powers and added them to my soul. Since they became part of a living pattern, they are no longer dormant, but awake and active and irradiate my soul with their divine working. Through this it receives a divine attribute. Hence the eating of the sacrificial flesh aided its healing. The ancients have also indicated this to us in that they taught us to drink the blood and eat the flesh of the Savior. Here the ancients, of course, would be the ancient Christians. The ancients believed that this brought healing to the soul. There are not many truths, there are only a few. Well, that's a comfort. Uh, <clears throat> their meaning is too deep to grasp other than in symbols. So the resurrection or the birth rebirth of the Godhead now has its effect on the psyches more personal or lesser parts. We are dealing here, among others, with the Eucharistic symbolism. By eating the flesh and the blood, we become sanctified. As he puts it, a terrible inextinguishable fire now burns in us. This is in another sentence. Something, and this is a quotation, something new has been added to the human personality that has communed with the sacred elements of the flesh and blood. But this truth, like some others, can only be grasped in symbols. The editor notes, and I quote, Jung developed his ideas concerning the significance of symbols in psychological types, in the book Psychological Types, which was published in 1921. So that would have been still within the period when he was writing the Red Book, but certainly quite a few years after he wrote the passages which are dealing with now, which were mostly written in 1914. Thus his statement to Roland Holst, the Dutch poet reported by Quispel and told by Professor Quispel to us in uh, 1975, that psychological types was written on the basis of 30 pages of the Red Book, might indicate that this chapter, or at least portions of this chapter, might have been part of those 30 pages. Because, as you will see, what became the teaching concerning the psychological types is beginning to develop in the Red Book in these chapters. And this chapter is then concluded by many large mandala images which we have all just viewed a few minutes ago. They run from page 80 to 97 in the German text. 
Now we move on to chapter 14, which interestingly enough is entitled Divine Folly, although originally in the in the black book notes it was called the first night. So when you look at these chapters and then you see second night, third night, and there is no first night, this is the first night. Only it has been changed to divine folly. It begins in the following manner. I am standing in a high hall. Before me I see a green curtain between two columns. Reminds one almost to a pathworking symbolism of the Golden Dawn system. To those of you to whom that means something. The curtain parts easily. I see into a small deep room with bare walls. There is a small window with bluish glass above. I set foot on the stair leading up to this room between the pillars and enter. In the rear wall I see a door right and left. It's as if I must choose between right and left. I choose the right. The door is open. I enter. I am in the reading room of a large library. In the background sits a small thin man of pale complexion, apparently the librarian. So it's sort of a typical archetypal image of a librarian, you know, a small and thin and of pale complexion of whatever sex. So the, uh, the atmosphere is troubling. Scholarly ambitions, scholarly conceit, wounded scholarly vanity, he feels all of this in the air, you know. And one, one can in certain libraries and, and classrooms, without a doubt. Apart from the librarian, I see no one. I step toward him, he looks up from his book and says, what do you want? Well, librarians are often that way, you know. Uh, you are interrupting, uh, you are interrupting what I am doing. Well, uh, what do you want? Mm -hmm. They never seem to realize that they are there for you, <laughs> uh, which is actually a failing of uh, most public officials and gov government functionaries <laughs> the world over, you know. So what do you want? I'm somewhat embarrassed since I don't know what I really want. Uh, Thomas Akempis crosses my mind. And so I say, I'd like to have Thomas Akempis' The Imitation of Christ. That's the book that he wanted. You know, it's a famous classic written by one of those mysterious mystics like the Rhineland mystics and all this has become, however, a very, very important source book over the ages of the, let's say, the interior approach to religion and to spirituality. Are you surprised that I'm requesting Thomas's work? He says, well, yes, the book is seldom asked for and I wouldn't have expected this interest from you. <laughs> says the kindly librarian. Uh, I must confess that I am also somewhat surprised by this inspiration, but recently I came across a passage from Thomas that made a particular impression on me. Why, I can't really say. If I remember correctly, it dealt with the problem of the imitation of Christ. The librarian, do you have particular theological or philosophical interests or... And he answers, do you mean whether I want to read it for the purpose of prayer? The librarian says, well, hardly. If I read Thomas Akempis, I do so for the sake of prayer or something similar rather than out of scholarly interests. Are you that religious? I had no idea, he says. <laughs> You know that I value science extraordinarily high, says Jung, but there are actually moments in life where science also leaves us empty and sick. In such moments, a book like Thomas's means very much to me, since it is written from the soul, says the librarian, but somewhat old-fashioned. We can no longer get involved in Christian dogmatics these days, surely. 
sounds almost as if he stepped out of the 21st century, doesn't he? We haven't come to, says Jung, we haven't come to an end with Christianity by simply putting it aside. It seems to me that there is more to it than we see. What is there about it? It's just a religion, says the librarian. So the librarian is the prototype of the intellectual, especially of the 19th and 20th century vintage, who wishes to discard religion, especially the Christian religion, in favor of a, a materialistic science and the kind of philosophy derived therefrom. Now the book The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis may be chosen here because of its emphasis on the inner, the spiritual side of life and religion, as against a more extroverted view. So Jung tells the librarian that he values science, but that there are times when science leaves us unsatisfied and that something deep and internal is needed. The librarian haughtily tells him in the further portions of the dialogue that there are good substitutes available now for most of what Christianity has to offer. And among these, wouldn't you know it, he comes up with Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, <laughs> which at that time, of course, would have really played that role in the minds of a lot of people, you know. And perhaps, as a kind of afterthought, he says, perhaps also Faust. I mean, of course, an other literary work that everybody in the German language is conversant with. Jung then engages in quite a disputation with the librarian, principally about the merits of Nietzsche's contribution to contemporary human spiritual aspiration. Jung expresses his regard for Nietzsche, which indeed he had, and if, you know, years ago I did a series of lectures on Jung's Zarathustra Nietzsche seminar, and there too, and Jung speaks very highly of Nietzsche, but in the end he points out that Nietzsche is very greatly flawed. So he expresses his regard for Nietzsche, but also says that his truth, Nietzsche's truth, strikes him, Jung, as too agitated and provocative. I think a better critique has never been made of Nietzsche <laughs> than those two, agitated and provocative. And that Nietzsche is good for only those souls who still need to free themselves from various restrictions. He says that recently he has discovered that many people need a more inward approach that makes the human smaller and humbler and that Nietzsche does not respond to his need. Well, of course not. <laughs> there is not too much humility in the concept of the Superman. Uh, um, so Jung says in his dialogue with the librarian, and this is a direct quotation now, Nietzsche speaks to those in need of more freedom, not to those who clash strongly with life, who bleed from wounds. And then later in life, Jung said very frankly that religion can only be replaced by religion. The scientism of his time he found as useless for the deeper spiritual needs of the soul as he found the bombastic iconoclasm of Nietzsche. Jung's position is best understood when one realizes that he viewed religion not as a matter of extroverted belief, but as a communing with internal realities. And that is precisely why he asks the librarian for the book by Thomas Akempis, rather than maybe by another Thomas like Thomas Aquinas, or by John Calvin, Horror of Horrors, mm -hmm who, after all, you know, had a great deal of influence in, in Switzerland. And that's where he held forth in his malign way in, in Geneva. So some of his words regarding these issues are, are very definite and very powerful. Jung's, here are some. Our natural model is Christ. We have stood under his law since antiquity, first outwardly and then inwardly. At first we knew this, and then knew it no longer. Christ remained in us and mastered us nevertheless. Of course, indicating that the real uh, 
The real religion has to do with the God within, and that you can outwardly discard that and cover it up by all kinds of things, but somehow, like the saying that Jung carved on his door, called or uncalled, the God will be present. And then he says, in that quote again, you can certainly leave Christianity, but it does not leave you. Your liberation from it is a delusion. Now, such words were certainly distasteful to the materialistic mind of the early 20th century, even as they may appear distasteful to many today. Yet we must understand that Jung's view has much merit when properly interpreted. First of all, he does not advocate Christianity as a... um, as an external dogmatic religious denomination, or even as the Christian denomination as such, let's say, denominated as against Judaism or as against Hinduism or something else. I remember a a, a story that the late Dr. James Kirsch, who was one of the early founders of the Jungian work here in in Southern California, Dr. James Kirsch told that when one of Jung's books had just appeared, probably Psychology and Alchemy, which talks a lot about Christ, Christ as the um, the paradigm of the individuated ego and so forth, and Dr. Kirsch, who of course was Jewish, wrote to Jung, what about us Jews? What's in it for us? You know? Uh, And Jung's answer was very uh, brief. And he said, you have him, you have Christ, and he is called Tifaret. So he identified Christ with the Sephira Tifaret on the tree of life, which is of course the messianic principle, so indicating that in what he was talking about was not a particular figure in history, although he certainly never denied it, but rather a spiritual principle of a messianic nature of very, very great archetypal importance and power for individual and culture. Secondly, the way of Christ referred to here, because he keeps using the term the way, is strictly an internal way. He says, we are crucified with him in ourselves. Good expression. He also says that Christ is the way, not the objective. The way, not the objective. It's a pattern. You see, the, the, the imitatio Christi is fulfilling the pattern of spiritual development, of individuation, including the sacrifice, but certainly not only the sacrifice, but also the resurrection that is present in that paradigmatic story. As Jung was to eloquently assert later in Psychology and Alchemy, Christ is the paradigm of the individuated ego. The figure of Christ is the representation of the self in the capital S. So in many ways we might say that the archetypal figure of Christ in Christianity is pretty much the same thing as Isdubar, whom we encountered earlier. That is the Christ within the hope of glory that St. Paul writes about. Jung also stated repeatedly that the Christian message has to be fulfilled and only then may we perhaps move on to other other religious contexts. Somewhere in my uh, voluminous but extremely untidy library there is a small book which contains essays by disciples, acquaintances of Jung, recounting their personal conversations with him. And there is one there, and I'll dig it out sometime, maybe some of you will be here, where Jung was asked if Christianity was by a person individually, whether Christianity was finished. And he said, oh no, it will be finished probably another 2,500 years from now. And then, he says, we may be ready for another religion. But he says, a religion has to fulfill itself. It has to fulfill its objectives in the world before it can give way to a new impulse. 
Well, that may be of some relevance here also. It has to be fulfilled. It would seem that Jung wholeheartedly agreed with Angelus Silesius, though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, and not in thee thy soul is all forlorn. And not so incidentally, where was this internal recognition of Christ understood ever since the very early Christian centuries? In what, in what circles, shall we say? Of course, by the Gnostics. The rediscovery of the Gnostic tradition in our era points to Jung's position. Jung warns that the abandoning of the psychological power and symbol system bodes ill for contemporary humanity. The rediscovery of the inner Christ is essential for humanity. Jung would be greatly alarmed, I think, by the current secular apostasy of much of the West, and he would not be pleased by the cheap cop-out of some who glibly assert that they are spiritual, but not religious. In this regard, I think uh, the the best recommendation that I can make is a wonderful book published within the last few years by our grand old man of religious studies, Houston Smith, entitled Why Religion Matters. Nice book. Get hold of it. It is not entirely certain why Jung named this chapter Divine Folly. One reason being that teachings like Nietzsche's, while they appear divine, are really foolish substitutes for real religion. The other is even more evident. When pursuing religious spiritual matters, one should not become exceedingly serious, says Jung in this chapter also but continue to remain in touch with the light-heartedness, the laughter, even the foolish joy of life. Very good advice under any circumstances. With that, I think we move on now to chapter 15, Nox Secunda, the second night. And this is a lengthy one. The chapter is very lengthy. I'm going to try to summarize it, however in a little more easy manner and the chapter contains several themes some of which do not seem to have much of an organic connection with each other one has to look very carefully in fact you know many of you have the book others are going to get it one advice that I can already give and that is don't be discouraged when you read and very often it will appear to you what is this all about How does this relate to what went before? How does it relate to anything? You know? And it always takes a while until you continue, maybe in the next chapter or so, then you begin to see the the continuity. And of course you will also see that what this book describes, and this certainly is worth reiterating again, what it describes is a process. What it describes is an ongoing movement of the soul that Jung goes through. And all along the various steps of that road, Jung is himself arguing against what is going on. He is himself asking all the time, what, what's going on? What is this all about? Why do I have to see this? Why do I have to do that? And it's the natural inquisitiveness, including the resistances that are present in all of us, But what perhaps distinguishes Jung from most of us is that in spite of these resistances and in spite of this internal argument, he keeps on. He doesn't stop. He is not deflecting. He doesn't go on another road. He he knows that he has to continue with this because this is the holy, the way, the holy way that he saw described in, uh, in when he opened up his mother's Bible at a very crucial period of his life, and the way there shall be, and a, a holy way, and one that even the fools will not err on. He said he knew that this was his way, and he would go on with it no matter what. And that, of course, is that kind of persistence always pays off in its own way. So all of these portions of the second night have a relationship to um, 
Jung's receiving the copy of Thomas O'Kempis's book. Thus the chapter opens with Jung wandering around in the building of the library, which he entered in the last chapter, and he comes to enter the kitchen. Well, that's quite understandable because Jung was very partial to eating well, which I think we all should be, and he was also um, partial to cooking himself. So he enters the kitchen. There a large and fat woman, you guessed it, the cook of the establishment, welcomes him and behold she also is a reader of the imitation of Christ. So that gives us some hope. If people in the kitchen read the Thomas Akempis, then things can't be all that bad. Um, he has a vague premonition that something important is about to happen. And indeed it does. While he's sitting there in the kitchen, the woman, uh, the, the cook is telling him about how much she likes uh, Thomas Akempis and makes her feel good. She can pray and all that sort of thing. Uh, scene begins to change and strange shadowy forms come first sort of like smoke moving to the place and all that and the shadowy forms begin to fill the room and a whirling whirling noise comes and he is quite uh, astonished what is this what, what is happening now the ghostly forms rush by like they are going somewhere they are rushing by fast and he hears them utter the words, let us pray in the temple, let us go and pray in the temple. And he addresses them and then receives a response as follows. When we came to this portion, I began to get a very strange feeling that perhaps we are meeting something here that I was quite familiar with from before. Where are you rushing off to? I call out to these forms. A bearded man with tousled hair and dark shining eyes stops and turns toward me. We are going to Jerusalem to pray at the Most Holy Sepulchre. And Jung says, take me with you. You cannot join us because you have a body, but we are the dead. Who are you? I am Ezekiel and I am an Anabaptist. It's a heck of an answer. He <laughs> uh, um, says, Who are those wandering with you? These are my fellow believers. Why are you wandering? We cannot stop, but must make a pilgrimage to all the holy places. What drives you to this? I don't know, but it seems that we still have no peace, although we died in the true belief. Why do you have no peace if you died in true belief? It always seems to me as if we had not come to a proper end with life. It says, Remarkable, how so? It seems to me that we forgot something important that should also have been lived. And what was that? Uh, would you happen to know he asks Jung with these words he reaches out greedily and uncannily toward me his eyes shining as if from inner heat and Jung tells him let go Daimon you did not leave your animal mm -hmm. now we'll come to that this is, of course, the prefiguration, the earliest manifestation of what became the seven sermons to the dead. This is when the dead were going to Jerusalem. And then, quite a bit later, they knocked at his door and said, We have come from Jerusalem where we did not find what we were seeking. And, of course, that is... Uh, a text very familiar to me because as far as I know and I, I certainly don't know everything but as far as I think commercially published books are concerned I was the only one who wrote an exegesis on the seven sermons to the dead which was published about 25 years ago 
and which in some ways really prefigured the coming of the Red Book. At least Dr. Shandasani indicated that to me. And he quotes from it in the Red Book uh, in, the, um, uh, in some of his, his um, footnotes. In any event, you know, this is a very important incident here. Now, Ezekiel, of course, is a prophetic name. And an Anabaptist, <laughs> well, you know, the Anabaptists is one of the earliest Protestant heresies. You know, when the Protestants came in to our Germany, there came the Anabaptists, they are called Anabaptists because those who baptize again, Wiedertäufer in German, the again baptizers, you know. So it, uh, it kind of indicates like a, a, a particularly extra, extra pious, unusual orientation. And so here they are, they're rushing off to Jerusalem, but Jung gives them a strange answer. And indeed this answer causes him all sorts of difficulties. Ezekiel the Anabaptist. Um, so Jung received a certain preparation for this encounter by several sayings from Thomas Akempis, which all indicate that one needs to use one's intuition rather than relying on more extroverted sources. And of course the very the, the extroverted nature of these these dead is also the fact that they want to go, they have to go physically to Jerusalem. They, they think that if they go there, that is where they are going to find something, and of course they don't. It is this instruction that impels Jung to tell the leader of the dead, the strange, give them him the strange statement, that he did not leave his animal which was the important thing that he thinks that he forgot. He forgot something. So Jung has always insisted that a balanced life was essential to his path to reality. And thus the unlived animal within the human, starved, filled with unexpressed instincts, celibate probably, would create an unbalanced condition that would haunt these souls even beyond the grave. To give them this answer strikes everybody as totally uncalled for, and as you can see here, its author, namely Jung, is regarded as insane. And now Jung finds himself in a very strange situation. You know, of course, that he was a psychiatrist and he was a, a... doctor who worked for a number of years in very famous mental institution, the Burghurtsley Hospital, so he's familiar with that sort of thing, but now he finds himself in a medical facility where he is subjected to the standard procedures to which mental patients at that time were subjected. His intuitions and inner life are totally disregarded by the people who come to see him, medical staff and so forth. He writes of this, The problem of madness is profound. Divine madness, a higher form of the irrationality of life, streaming through us, at any rate a madness that cannot be integrated into present society. But how? What if the form of society were integrated into madness. Mm. Well, I think some of us think that it already is. <coughs> but that's an, another matter again. At this point, things grow dark, and there is no end in sight. So he's in a very uh, despairing condition. Incidentally, a passage quoted here in a footnote from the draft, when he talks about the draft, when Dr. Shandasani mentions the draft, those are always the black books in which Jung wrote the original version of this, and then from here he copied into the red book. But there are certain statements that he left in the black book, and he did not enter into the red book. And so that is what is taking place here too. One of the the statements from the draft has some reference to concepts, again, that are found in psychological types. So that we can see that this is the part of the book, or at least this was one of the parts of the book that was used for that purpose. 
In the following passages, Jung calls attention through metaphors and otherwise to the need for balance, emphasizing particularly what later became known as the function of thinking and feeling. See, those are the first, I mean, there are various ways in which one perceives the duality. Certainly the material and the non-material is one duality that, that we very easily recognize. But then the next one is usually the, um, the duality of thinking and feeling. Those are the, the two great primary dualities in the four functions of consciousness. And then, of course, there are sensation and intuition. But here he speaks about these quite a bit. He already mentioned the intuition as related to divine grace when referring to Thomas Kempis, and in a sense he also mentioned sensation as the animal which we must live. We have here in seminal form really the four functions mentioned. He then returns to comment on his controversial statement he made to Ezekiel the Anabaptist that he should have lived his animal. And he says here, I quote, He who never leaves his animal must treat his brother like an animal. Abase yourself and leave your animal so that you will be able to treat your brother correctly. You will thus redeem all those roaming dead who strive to feed on the living. Oh my, vampires. And do not turn anything you do into law, since that is the hubris of power. So he is really referring to here to the situation that when the, um, well, when the instinctual, the physical, the lower self is not recognized and is abused and not given its due, it turns people into a cruel, and judgmental and unbalanced people. That's why I'm very much against fasting. First of all, because I like to eat. (laughs) That's an important reason right there. (laughs) But but secondly, other than a temporary exercise, you know, starved people are mean people. Starved people, starved people become nasty people. And just like he says here, then they begin to treat other people badly. So that whenever there is a a radical repression, an unbalance of that sort in the individual, it will externalize itself, it will externalize itself in an unhappy way. And of course what we are dealing with here too, and some of Jung's further statement indicate that what we have here is really the thinking function versus versus the sensate nature. When when the idea of the mind, you know, purity, fasting, chastity, whatever it is, when the mind becomes obsessed with these ideas, then everything else suffers. And it's the obsessions of the mind, the conceptual obsessions that are really, at least at this particular time in history, I think the cause is some of the greatest and most widespread evils in the world. They always have been, but they are able to do that more now than ever before. The evils of the Nazis originated in mental obsession. Being a little bit closer to one's emotions, closer to one's body, closer to these sorts of realities, that would impel a person to see that the kind of horrible cruelty, extermination of people is reprehensible. It's not to be done. But the mind says otherwise. The mind develops a conscious, oh, he says, you know, these are, these are bad people. These are, these are the bad element of society. They have to be wiped out. And similarly, with a, in a little different form, with Stalin and Mao Tse Tung and all the others, the horrible cruelties in our world are all the result of mental obsession. The mind is a very, very dangerous thing. And so, he muses then on the meaning of the symbolism of the dead. Why are these people dead? Because, he says, these are the souls who have not attained to the life of the fulfillment of what he later on came to call individuation. Those who are 
not growing in the spirit, who are not becoming more than what they are, are dead. Are dead. The life is the life of spiritual growth, the life of individuation, the life of the expansions of consciousness. And when that isn't working, then one is dead. And thus we come to the 16th chapter, which is called the third night. And here Jung continues with the uh, decidedly unpleasant story of being in an insane asylum. I bet his enemies are going to make something of these chapters. Mm. And there he's talking to a doctor, to a patient and various people who are there. Yet at the beginning of the chapter, the experiences he has in this condition show themselves as chaotic. And also when you read these, these chapters, beginning with the last one, at least the story of after he talks to the dead and then everything changes and they, they drag him off to his hospital room and so on. There is something strange about it. All of a sudden the level of the story becomes kind of trivial and chaotic and, and you wonder what has happened. You, you find the shifting of gears in the book and I couldn't at first feel, geez, you know, what is this? Well, we can see why that is so. He refers to the way things are going as madness. Yet his soul speaks to him at the beginning of the chapter, reminding him that he ought to abstain from formulating and explaining this madness in words. He says, don't don't use too many words, don't use too many words. Hmm. Which actually he has been told long before, I think, by the anchorite. The reference is most likely to the kind of madness, perhaps, that Plato speaks about, calling it mania, you know, altered states of consciousness. He is bidden to contemplate the phenomena of the mind without imposing rules on it. You know, don't, don't be so disturbed by the uh, lack of rationality, the lack of logic of what is going on, but just look at it and experience it. He is told by his soul, madness is a special form of the spirit and clings to all teachings and philosophies. Man strives toward reason only so that he can make rules for himself. Life itself has no rules. That is its mystery and its unknown law. What you call knowledge is an attempt to impose something comprehensible on life. And of course we all do that. And I'm sure that in many situations that is a necessary exercise. But we also need to keep in mind that we should not be so concerned with imposing rules on our experience as what? Experiencing our experience. If we really experience our experience, then we derive the full benefit from it. If we start monkeying with it all the time and trying to put it within certain rational boundaries, then we lose a great deal. Among other things, I think these conclusions are also borne out by modern psychedelic research and then he has various visions one is of Gnostic interest he sees the sun rising in red glory and in it is a cross from which a serpent hangs he is bidden to accept the turbulence and the lowest in himself as it surfaces and he concludes my speech is neither light nor dark since it's the speech of someone who is growing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it needs any a great deal of, of commentary. Certain clues to the message of this rather lengthy chapter may arise from, you know, various analyses and, and views of visionary experience. In any event, with that we come to the 17th chapter, which is called the fourth night. And now, some of the strangeness of the last three chapters resolves itself. The mystery of the the last few chapters, well, at least the last two, is finally solved. Jung, what does Jung do? He wakes up in the librarian's kitchen, Mm -hmm. greeted by the corpulent cook 
who happily informs him that he had dozed off and slept for over an hour. <laughs> Thus the whole turbulent sequence of his confinement in a mental hospital was a sort of lucid nightmare, a dream within a dream or within a vision. Yet there are some significant lessons to be deduced from it also. One of these is the fact that when advocating a balanced view, one is almost inevitably condemned by people who cannot apprehend a view divergent from their own. When confronted with Ezekiel, the leader of the restless dead, the Anabaptist, the restless dead who are on their way to Jerusalem, Jung tells him that he did not leave his animal, and the librarian and the others of the household immediately assume that he is mad and lock him up. The other is that one's progress in the greater life, one's individuation, as it came to be called later, does not occur without resistance and conflict as well as confusion. As stated in the um, very beginning of the Gospel of Thomas, let him who seeks keep seeking until he finds, and when he finds, he will be troubled. There are, of course, other steps after that. So Jung is also troubled there, and he is introduced here at the librarian's house, among others, that's already when he awakened from the dream, he is introduced to a scene from Wagner's Parsifal. You may recall that he had a bit of a Wagnerian scene there once much, much earlier, when he killed Siegfried on the road, but now he is introduced to a, a, a sort of a scene from Wagner's Parsifal where he learns to identify with two figures simultaneously. He sees these like, like on a stage, like on a play. One being Klingsor, who in this case is an opponent of Parsifal of sorts, and then the heroic figure of Parsifal himself. And Jung comes to realize that he is both the hero and the anti-hero, the light and the shadow. In fact, in many respects, chapters 15, 16, 17, all show Jung's increasing awareness of and reconciliation with what later came to be known as the shadow. This is sort of what these chapters were moving toward, and now we are really coming to it. Initially, this issue is approached by Jung by dwelling on the opposites and on the need to accept these opposites within oneself. Gradually, the issue is clarified further. When perceiving that the shadow is dark, unlived and primitive, yet important for the total personality. Yet most significantly, Jung says in this chapter that this is done not merely for the sake of some kind of balance, which would be a trivial objective indeed, but for what? For the sake of the God, as he puts it. Thus we may perhaps translate the proposition by stating that the ego or number one personality is in need of accepting the shadow or the number two sub-personality and all of this is done for the sake of the self, the God, the oversoul, manifest as Isdrubar in the earlier chapters. Thus Jung writes in part, here I quote, when the God enters my life, I return to my poverty for the sake of God. I accept the burden of poverty and bear all my ugliness and ridiculousness and also everything reprehensible in me. I couldn't be clearer than that. I thus relieve the God of all the confusion and absurdity that would befall him if I did not accept it. With this I prepare the way for the God's doing. So the, um, the uh, interpretation of this would be that the self, the self with the capital S, the oversoul and so forth, is hampered by a condition wherein the lesser self or the ego is not in touch with its own shadow, is not aware of its own failings, is not aware of its own unlived side, 
in order for the higher to become fully operative, the lower has to become recognized, has to have its due once again. Does mean it has to be lived out. If I have a, a murderous shadow, which probably most of us do, I, 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 I fully admit that there, there were one or two instances in my life where I, I could have killed somebody. I really could have. I, I, but that's not so terribly important. The important thing is that I did not do so. <laughs> And hopefully will not do so in the remaining few years of my life. But you know, we are. But when we, the, the really dangerous part, of course, of the shadow is always when we are not in touch with the beginning, come out and possess us and make us do things. And so, um, in order for the higher to function properly, this lower thing down here in the basement has to be recognized and given its due. You know, like an animal, it maybe even has to be fed. You know, throw him a, throw him a piece of, uh, I don't know what, chicken meat now and then. <coughs> um, very, very important. Now, uh, so the statement couldn't be clearer. For the sake of the self, the God within, the shadow has to be accepted by the ego. But is this all? You know, the, um, this is the, the question, I have heard that question when studying Jung in general. Is that just all? I mean, are we just going to become more sane by being more balanced? Is that it? It's not that exciting. It's not that, not that romantic. And you know, who the heck just wants to be balanced? I don't. <laughs> I don't know about you. But you know, as an objective, it, it, it's a very, uh, very mundane kind of a, of a condition. No doubt many people should be more balanced than they are. Listen, I, I don't deny that. But, but of course, while that may be the mistaken view of some people in psychotherapy, that's not really, really what Jung is saying. Certainly not throughout the, the Red Book. In a passage dating about four years later, Dr. Shandasami quotes a truly magical passage which is uttered by Phanes. Phanes is the God who is born, the God who comes forth. And this is very closely related to Philemon, whom we'll encounter on the next occasion. In fact, Philemon becomes... Phanes eventually. Phanes stands for sort of here for the ultimate reality, for pleroma, for transcendental being. And let me conclude with that, and I think you will find that it was really worth concluding with. This is from the black books. The mystery of this is Phanes speaks here. This was written in 1918, incidentally, if that is of any importance. The mystery of the summer morning, the happy day, the completion of the moment. Just, you know, think of all of these individually. The fullness of the possible, born from suffering and joy, the treasure of eternal beauty, the goal of the four paths, the spring and the ocean of the four streams, the fulfillment of the four offerings and the four joys, father and mother of the gods of the four winds, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and man's divine enhancement, highest effect and non-being, world and grain, eternity and instance, poverty and abundance, Evolution, death, and the rebirth of God, born by eternally creative power, resplendent in eternal effect, loved by the two mothers and sisterly wives, ineffable pain-ridden bliss, unknowable, unrecognizable, a hair's breadth between life and death, a river of worlds canopying the heavens. I give you philanthropy, the opal jug of water. He pours water and wine and milk and blood, food for men and gods. I give you the joy of suffering and suffering of joy. I give you what has been found, 
the constancy in change and the change in constancy, the jug made of stone, the vessel of completion, water flowed in, wine flowed in, milk flowed in, blood flowed in, the four winds precipitated into the precious seed, the gods of the four heavenly realms hold its curvature, the two mothers and the two fathers guard it, the fire of the north burns above its mouth, the serpent of the south encircles its bottom, the spirit of the east holds one of its sides, and the spirit of the west the other. Forever denied, it exists forever, recurring in all forms forever the same, this one precious vessel, surrounded by the circle of animals, denying itself and arising in new splendor through its self-denial. Perfected indeed, truly perfected is he who knows this. Perfection is poverty, but poverty means Gratitude, gratitude is love. In truth, perfection is sacrifice. Perfection is joy and anticipation of the shadow. Perfection is the end. The end means the community, hence perfection means community. I am perfection, but perfected is only he who attained his limits. I am the eternal light, but perfect is he who stands between day and night. I am eternal love, but perfect is he who placed the sacrificial knife beside his love. I am beauty, but perfect is he who sits against the temple wall in men's shoes for money. He who is perfect is simple, solitary, and unanimous. Hence he seeks diversity, community, ambiguity. Through diversity, community, and ambiguity, he advances towards simplicity, solitude, and unanimousness. So here is the ultimate, the transcendental, the real speaking. And he says, you know, you, when you are perfected yourself, then you have the two opposites balanced within yourself, but I am above that balance. I am the one from where they both come and whither they go. And so we have the um, uttering and the understanding here of the fullness of an utterly transcendental being. And then he, he says in the next chapters, actually, ways have been opened to the primordial and to the future. I feel the things that were and that will be. The earth gives me back what it hid. And he moves on now in the next chapter, which is entitled Three Prophecies, to actual chronological prophetic material. He now he begins to speak from an incredibly deep and transcendental level. He says in one of the black books relating to that material that he sees what is going to happen on the earth 800 years from now. Uh, so it's uh, it is truly moving into a um, very very unusual kind of material but it is all grounded in this so that's why I wanted to conclude with the statement of Fani is that beyond the one who is individuated who is perfected in whom the uh, the opposites have now come to a balance there is something else there is the source it is that source from which everything has come. It is that source to which everything returns. And it's very, very important to have at least a little intuitive grasp of that because that is really the divine ground from which all of these trees of life grow. And it is the one from which the vision and the prophecy and the, uh, the revelation of this book ultimately has come from also. And I promise you some truly astonishing disclosures <laughs> without trying to advertise the material in, in the following material. So I hope that this has been of interest to you and thank you so very much. Catalog number 200506. For more information about available lecture titles and for many other resources, visit gnosis.org. That's G-N-O-S-I-S dot O-R-G.